Church family, y'all can have a seat this morning. Welcome to Freedom Fellowship. I was thinking, you know, several months ago now, uh, we went to two services because you just couldn't put us all in one room. You know that? And so now we have two services, and I'm just grateful. I look around, I'm like, well, hey, you know what, friends? There's room. We made some room. There's room. And I know that God has been bringing uh, many people. There's just, there's several visitors even in the room today, and so I'm grateful for that. And isn't it true that the battle belongs to the Lord? You know, even in first services, I was just praying and, and getting prepared to come up and just speak to y'all today from the Word of God. Uh, I know that there are people struggling. I know that there's hardship. I know that sometimes there's confusion and just an unknowing of what direction to go. And I'm just here to tell you this morning, as we sung together, the battle belongs to the Lord. So let's just put it in his hands, and we're going to pray together right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, that it is your battle that you are more than capable to carry us through this life and to carry us into your own presence. And Father, it's not up to us. And so, Lord, as I think about those who just go through struggle and hardship and strife, even on a beautiful day like the day you've given us today, we pray, Lord, that you would just strengthen those that find themselves in a battle. And Lord, as we continue to learn together what it means to live in accordance with your Holy Spirit, that you would teach, God, would you teach? Would you teach by the authority of your word? And would you teach by that still, small voice, your very Holy Spirit of God inside of us? And we love you. And we look forward to even what you would do through the teaching of your word, through the worship that we've had together, and through the worship as we close the service together, and the day ahead of us that you have pre-planned for us. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. You know, there has been so many things going on around the church this week ahead. Uh, this, this last week, uh, Pastor Cole started this week, so Pastor Cole has been kicking around. And you know, if you guys have ever been to work and you had a first day of work and you thought... Well, I wonder what the first day of work's going to be like. His first day of work was painting. He showed up, I'm like, hey, guess what? We got rooms to paint. Let's go. You might not have thought that that was the first day of a pastor's job, but you know what? You, you do a little bit of all of it, don't you? Uh, but we got him moved into his office and um, painted the family room here and uh, just encouraged by that. We had people all over this place throughout the week. I was thinking, in the last week, what has God just been kind of stirring around this place? We had Charlie and Lewis working on the basement door, so we got outside entry to that basement door now for um, the kids that use that throughout the week. We've got a homeschool network that meets here. On Mondays, they'll be starting to meet, and so we wanted to make sure that they could get in and out real easy, and plus all the kids we had downstairs uh, in first service and even in this service. Marcus and Ashley are kicking the youth group back off, so there's youth group tonight, sixth grade through seniors in high school. Amen to that. 5.30, be here for that. Uh, September 29th, we have a church barbecue that's going to be happening. September 29th, you'll hear a lot more. We'll have slides and all that. But Bobby and AJ were kind of securing the meat and some of the details on that. So we're going to have smoked pork. We're going to have a big smoker out here. The church is going to provide the meat, and so y'all will provide the sides. It's going to be a pretty cool throwdown party. Both services, everybody will be there at noon. And uh, Pastor Jeff and Boyd were working this last week at Lighthouse. You know, Lighthouse kept flooding. If you're new to our uh, fellowship here, we were given a building, basically, and we've turned it into a community center, and God's been doing all kinds of things down there. Uh, but in the process of that, we've been having to rehab that old building, and they have been working a lot. Uh, and then I was thinking about the groups with Ben Davitt and Lisa and Pete leading the groups around this place and so many others. So uh, mowing the meals that were happening this Tuesday at Lighthouse, Brenda and Shannon and Bobby and the ladies. And guys, can I just tell you that we're just getting started. I mean, God, God is certainly not done with what we're going to be doing in, in this community. I mean, he's not going to just pull the plug and be done. So it's like, hey, praise God. So as we learn about what it means to walk by the Spirit, it would be a terrible travesty to say, well, all of these people, as they are moving and doing, that they are just checking a box. They feel this strange religious obligation, and so they're just going to do it. No. This is what living in the Spirit looks like. And so many of you, following God's promptings throughout your week, have done exactly what it is that He's asked you to do. Now, I know that we fall in different ways. We're going to be talking about that today. But the reality is, uh, we want to live a Spirit-filled life. And this series that we've been looking at called This Life I Live, it's a look at living in the Spirit. And it, as I noticed last week, or as I, I noted to you guys, that I underlined the His, His life I live. Is this life you live his life. 
Last week, when we talked about these icons, how the different icon each means something different, it's just helpful for us as we move through the weeks to have a, a visual kind of uh, moniker that helps us remember what it is that we're learning. Last week, we talked about Galatians 2.20. For I've been crucified with Christ, and that it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the idea is to live a spirit-filled life, the first thing that you're going to have to do is die. You're thinking, Pastor Ben, that doesn't sound like a very happy thought. It's not. But as I heard years ago, an old preacher said, if you've been crucified, you know it. And I'd ask you, have you been crucified? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you gotten to a point in your life where you said, it's not going to be my life anymore? And this life I live is his life, and I'll be living it for his glory. This week, what we're going to be looking at is by walking by the Spirit. And so you see a little flame. A little flame has signified the Holy Spirit for years and years For 2,000 years in the Christian faith, ever since Pentecost, when flames of fire dropped down on their heads in Acts chapter 2. And so what we'll look at today is just that, what it means to walk by the Spirit. It is a terrifying thing to give your life to God. It's a terrifying thing to no longer be in control of your own life. But once you've given your life over, you say, Pastor Ben, these are kind of philosophical ideas that you're talking about because my heart is still beating. My lungs are still breathing. I'm still alive. What do I do with my life? What does it look like to live a spirit-filled life? Well, what we're going to learn today is that you walk by the Spirit. So I'd encourage you to take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5, same book that we were in last week, but we'll just flip a few pages ahead to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 16 through 25, walking by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul starts by saying this in verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit. If you like underlining in your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to underline right there. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These two are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Interesting little uh, end to the sentence there, so that you may not do the things that you please. You think, well, what is What is that talking about? It's reference to this idea that the Apostle Paul shares with us in Romans chapter 7, where the Apostle Paul describes a struggle, spirit versus flesh, and what this looks like. And he says, hey, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. There's there's a battle going on. And so he's confronting the Galatians. He says, sometimes you can't do what you're supposed, what you want to do. Verse 18, as we continue, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you. He says, warning, (laughs) these are the deeds of the flesh. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we'll look at this a little bit later, but the question is, if you have these things routinely and regularly in your life, if you practice such things, warning, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this is the place where for many, many of us it's familiar. The fruit of the Spirit, however, not the deeds of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. See that? Just like last week? If you belong to Christ Jesus, you've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The first point for today coming from Galatians chapter 5 is this, learn how to walk, learn how to walk, continuous consultation and submission to the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. To walk is a conscious, habitual action. When you look through the context of the scripture and all the times that it says that they walked with God and that they walked a certain way, it's talking about a lifestyle that you live. It's not always talking literally about going out and walking down the street, right? Sometimes it's talking about the life that you live. Now, if you've ever seen a kid 
start to walk, you realize what it takes, don't you? None of you in the room today has ever had a niece or a nephew or a child that just one day decided, well, today is the day, and they stood up and they walked. Never having walked before, and they just stood up and walked. Like, that would be insane, because it's never happened. Now, some of the moms will say, well, yeah, yeah, but I had a certain kid, and they took off right away. That's true. Our kids, maybe it took them a week to figure it out once they started moving. Maybe it took them a month. Maybe it took them a year. But if you ever seen a kid start to learn how to walk, it's a process, isn't it? It doesn't just happen just like that. First thing they start to do is maybe they start to roll over. And, and maybe you were changing a diaper one day, and you, you turn to the side to grab a wipe, and you turn back over, whoop, they'd rolled over. Man, they about rolled right off the couch. And that's just the beginning, isn't it? That's the next thing that they, they start to do is they start to scoot. And you set them on the floor, and you go in the kitchen, and you came back, and they were over trying to climb up the bookshelf, right? And you thought, what, what is happening here? They are learning how to move. They are learning how to walk. It's just a process. It takes time. And before you know it, you say, man, my house, my house is not childproof at all. Like all of a sudden, everything in your house seems like a loaded gun. It's like, why are there things everywhere that you can't put in your mouth, you know? And if you're out of that stage for a while like we are, and then you have somebody come over that has a little baby that's rolling around and crawling across the floor, you realize, oh my word, this is like death everywhere and destruction. It's learning how to walk. It's a process. They roll over, they crawl, they start pulling themselves up, and then the next thing that you know, they're starting to walk. And what do they do? They, they, do they just, oh, well, I'm up, so then they just take off running? No, not yet. They take those first couple of steps, don't they, where they're trying to figure out the mechanics of it and how this, this whole thing works. And usually, I'd say basically every time, they'll take a couple of steps, and then what happens? They fall. Now, in the fall, do you look at them and you say, hey, what's wrong with you? Why did you fall? Chastise them? Absolutely not. Any parent, and today, man, everybody's got their phones out and their video. And they're like, oh, yay, yay, good job. And the kid, they either fall or they like rapidly descent, right? You can see it. Sometimes they think they're like, I have, I've never been here before. I don't know what to do. And they just drop. Why do I talk about learning how to walk today? Christians need to learn how to walk. Some of you are new in your Christian faith, and you're getting to a point where you're realizing, I need to learn how to walk. I was living a lifestyle before where I knew how things went, but all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit came into my life, I realized that the things that I used to do, like we talked about last week, the things that I was familiar with, those things are no more. Those are not the things that I'm supposed to do. And so you, you, you walk just like you used to walk. You walk right into those things, and you go, dude, this is not what I'm supposed to do anymore. And so as a Christian, you learn how to walk. You bobble. You start rolling over at first, and then you're crawling across the floor, and then you get up off the floor, and you get a new perspective on life, and you're starting to see things from different angles, and you're thinking, this is different. This is new. This is a new direction for my life. But I'm not quite familiar with it yet. Things are curious. Things are awkward. And I'm still, I'm not walking with fluidity. I'm walking really kind of hobbling. And, and then I fell. Can I tell you that God, your father, doesn't look at you down his nose when you're just starting to learn how to walk and shake his head in disgust? What do you do that for? No, what you're doing is you're learning how to walk. Now, last week, we talked about the difference between conviction and, and condemnation, didn't we? That, that Romans 8 one says, there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. That if you are found in Christ, if you have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you, that you are not condemned by God. God doesn't look down his nose at you and say that you're not doing good enough what's wrong. Instead, what you get is that subtle conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you this, if you're learning how to walk and you're bobbling along your way and you find yourself falling down, you will have the conviction of God. God's conviction will come upon you and it will feel uncomfortable. He'll say, don't go that way. Don't do it like that. I have a different path for you. Don't you see the new perspective? Are you learning how to walk? This is the first point that Paul is trying to tell us. If we're going to live a spirit-filled life, we need to learn how to walk the way that God would have us to walk. 
And when we fall, he doesn't look at us in disgust, but he also doesn't leave us alone. He will tell us that is the wrong way. Ephesians 5.15 says this, Therefore, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. If you're saying, oh, Pastor Ben, I understand these philosophical ideas that you're talking with me about dying to myself and living to Christ, but I want to know a practical way. What does it look like? Study what it looks like to learn how to walk. And we're going to find that in the Galatians passage. You're going to find it right here in Ephesians chapter 5. Here's the practical ways. Walk not as unwise men, but wise. Making the most of your time. You can underline some of these words if they jump out to you. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, even to the Father. What does it look like when a Christian starts to learn how to walk? It looks like Ephesians chapter 5. Wisdom starts to come into your life. It's a wisdom that's not just your own. It's a wisdom that comes from God. And you say, Pastor Ben, I, I've learned some things in this life, and there's some things that I've learned that were just totally worldly. And I thought that that was the way that I was supposed to live, but when I lived that way, it didn't turn out. And I want to live for Christ. I want new wisdom and new direction in my life. How can I find it? You know, the Bible is full of literature that's called wisdom literature. You want to have wisdom? Read the wisdom literature. Some of the wisdom literature is called Proverbs. When you read through the Proverbs, you're getting the wisdom of God. It's a wisdom from heaven. And us as Christians, we are supposed to grow in wisdom. I would say this, you know, if you, there are many Christians that, that are in the world today that they have given their life to Christ. They have understood what it means that Jesus Christ paid the penalty of sin, that he shed his blood on a cross that God demanded a perfect sacrifice and that Jesus was that sacrifice. And when we place our faith and trust in him, we're born again, we're saved, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. There are very many Christians that understand that, but you know what? They never learned how to walk. They're still on the ground, crawling around, groping around like a very, very small child. And here's the thing, it's time to get off the ground. We're by the Spirit of God and by the power of God, we're going to crawl ourselves up the bookshelf. We're going to gain the new perspective. Pastor Ben, how do you do that? Well, you find yourself in the Word of God. Amen? And you gain new perspective and you gain new insight and you're learning how to walk. And can I tell you that God is so pleased by those who are learning how to walk? He's so pleased when He looks out and He sees people living by the Spirit and taking His direction. You gain wisdom. How about your time? Are you making the most of your time from Ephesians chapter 5? This is one I can tell you assuredly that I struggle with. To know, God, in your goodness and grace, in, in your divine plan, in, in your sovereign will over my life to know the number of my days, how am I to spend my time? You ever wake up in the morning and you look at your day ahead and you just wonder, Lord Jesus, is this what you want me to do? Lord Jesus, what would you have me to do with my time? For our time on this earth is, it's limited. All of us, by the grace of God, have been given the opportunity for eternal life. And all people, whether we put our faith and trust in Christ or not, will live eternal life. You will live separated from God forever in a place that's called hell, that Jesus talked about more than anyone else. Or you will live forever with God. In glory, the, the Christian Bible says, you know, in a beautiful place, it's, it's a wonderful situation. But the, between that time where we meet him face to face and that time where we are born is this life. And my question is this, friends. Are you making the most of your time? Are you making the most of your time? This encouragement isn't an encouragement to quit everything you're doing and change every single thing in your life, but it's to ask this question, Lord Jesus, I'm learning to walk. And I want to live a life that's glorifying to you. And to put one foot in front of the other, Lord, would you just illuminate my path? I want to do what you want me to do. And can I tell you this? If you're willing to give your life to Christ and you're willing to live a spirit-filled life, there will absolutely be times that God would say, I want you to do this today. And you're going to say, oh, mercy, I got a lot of other things to do that's not that, right? 
well, I, I don't know. Lord, well, you know what that would take for me to rearrange things, to do that thing that you're asking me to do? Friends, this is what it means to be following the Spirit of God, to do what it is that God asks you to do. And you need to be aware and secure in the fact that it is God, and it's not the pizza that you had last night or this fleshly desire that's just impressing on you because you feel bad or whatever. Many of us, however, if we would just to check our app statuses, we would see how much time got wasted there. And not every app is a waste of time, but I would say some absolutely are. Are you making the most of your time? Will you look back over your life and regret time wasted? Will you look forward at your children and you'll say, how, where did the time go? Uh, spirit-filled people are people that are looking to the Lord Jesus Christ to best utilize their time. Who should I spend my time with? Where should I spend my time? How can I invest the days that you've given me? What's the direction of my life, Lord, that you would help me that I would invest my time? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us about God's will, that God delivers us, and then through his will, we get to understand what we should do and where we should go and how we should ask, act. Do you know God's will for your life? Ephesians tells us that do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Do you know God's will for your life? To not know would be maybe, according to this verse, foolish. You know, we have all of these helps in our lives today. Our lives are actually pretty cushy, if you really boil it down, compared to generations before. Some of you guys grew up in houses that didn't even have water, running water. That's just within a generation. And we think about, well, what should I be spending my time on? And what kind of things? How do I discover God's will? You know that you can get on a computer and you can look up a Bible app and you can search in that will of God. Whoop! From the word of God. This is the Lord's will. This is the Lord's will. This is the Lord's will. This, well, how do I know what God's will is? Well, do what you did when you tried to figure out what to make for supper and you Googled it. You could find the will of God in the Holy Word of God. And if you're not familiar with the Word of God, use a tool like that that directs you to the Word. You want to go to the Word of God and be filled with the Spirit, not filled with dissipation, not filled with overindulgence, not filled with degenerate situations, but filled with this direction of God's holy will. And I want to look at one other thing in that Ephesians chapter 5 when we're learning how to walk and we're stumbling around. There's words that just sometimes jump off the page when I read them in the scripture. Speaking, singing, giving thanks. This is, this is God on your lips. This is God, the overflow of your heart. And I would ask you this, when you get through your week and you look back, were you singing and giving thanks and singing hymns and songs and spiritual th songs? And you go, Pastor Ben, that's hokey. I don't, live, I don't do that, but some of you know exactly what that's like. To change some of your music, to change what it is that you're focusing on, to have a direction, and then all of a sudden there's an overflow and you're speaking and giving thanks and making melody with your heart to the Lord. And you say, well, well what is that? It's not hokey, friends. That is the Spirit of God. That is Spirit filled living. Some of you would say, well, could I really live that life? And some of you would say, well, I remember that life. I've been there before, but I'm not there now. You can get back off the floor. Start to walk. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ and do what he says. It's a continuous consultation and submission to the Holy Spirit. The next thing is this, the spirit versus flesh. Spirit versus flesh. The spirit and the flesh pull in different directions. I put there for your second point. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. I want you to take your fists like this. And I want you to put them against each other just like this. You just put it, just kind of humor me. We're going to learn about this. The spirit and the flesh are against each other. You can set them down if you want. They're in opposition to each other so that you may not do the things that you please. There is a conflict of two natures. And time and time again, you know, years ago when I was learning in my Christian life and I'm trying to understand the scriptures and I'm asking God for direction, and I started to realize this. I was living my life in a way that believed that I had like 80% full on the Holy Spirit and then like 20% the flesh. Or I'd start sinning quite a bit and the tables would turn and, 
okay, well, now I'm, I'm kind of sinning I'm more like 75% sin, but it's 25% Holy Spirit in my life. That's kind of how it's working. Can I tell you that is not at all a biblical concept and idea? That is not how it works. The Spirit-filled life is spirit versus flesh. They're in opposition to each other. What that means is when you start to sin, you are going the opposite direction of God's will. You're not doing like, well, I'm sinning, so I'm only like 75% in the wrong and 25% right. You're 100% wrong. Now, the inverse is also true. If you are walking in the Spirit of God and you are doing what God has called you to do and you are living the fruit of the Spirit, as we'll look at soon, you can guarantee you are 100% in God's will. It's not like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm getting there. I'm a little bit there. No, you are 100% there. This is a different way of looking at life. And I'll tell you this, when you start to see it that way, conviction will settle in on your life. When you're wake up, waking up in the morning and you're thinking about where to go on your phone before you even get out of bed or you're thinking about whatever, and it could just be, you know, the thing that you're wanting to bid on next online or whatever it is, you will start to hear that still small voice, the Holy Spirit of God. Don't do that. Do this. This is the direction. And friends, can I tell you, it's a 100% one direction or 100% the other direction. This is the Spirit-filled life. It's the conflict of two natures. Galatians 5.17 says the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, the, desire, the, the Spirit against the flesh. They're in opposition. And before you were a Christian, you had struggle. Before you were a Christian, life had its different hang-ups and, and situations. The struggle in your life was an absence of joy, an absence of purpose, an absence of direction, an absence of peace. That was true of a life lived without Christ. But since Christ comes into your life, you have direction, you have purpose, you have an understanding, but is it always easy? No. Well, Pastor Ben, before it wasn't easy and now it's not easy. What's the difference? The difference is that the scales have come off your eyes. And you realize it's not just a percentage of I'm 30% in God's will and you know, 70% against it or whatever. It's not that. The, the scales fall off your eyes and you realize, I'm on the floor. I'm going the wrong direction. By the power and, and authority of God, I need to go in a different direction. Lord Jesus, I need you to guide me. That's the struggle. The struggle in the Christian life is spirit versus flesh. And friends, if you think that you have exalted yourself high above that struggle, you are dead wrong. You would be claiming an authority higher than the Apostle Paul himself. He said in Romans, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I do not want to do, I do. This is a battle. They're in opposition to each other. You don't sin a little. <laughs> you sin 100%. You don't follow Christ a little. You follow Christ 100%. Do you see how that works and how it's different? And this is the life that God has for us, a life following him and being 100% guilt-free of the things that are in the past. And when we turn and we obey the desires of the flesh, that we can just as easily turn back and obey the desires of the Spirit. Romans 8.5 5 says this, For those who walk according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Again, if you like underlining verses in your Bible, you can underline verse 6. It's so powerful. Verse 7 says, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It doesn't even know how to do it. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When you make that decision for the direction of your life, and it can just be for a, for a moment, it can be for a day, it can be for a week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. It's either 100% in the direction of God or 100% opposite in the direction against God. If the mind is set on the flesh, and this is what you're fixed on, this is what I'm going to do, this is where I'm going to go, this is what I'm going to spend my time on, this is where my money is going to go, this is how I'm going to handle this conversation, I can't believe that person did it again, they're going to get the full wrath out of me, whatever it is, right? My brother and sister, they're doing it again, they got in my room, they took my stuff, whatever, this is how I'm going to... If it's the flesh... If that's the direction, according to the Spirit and according to the text that God has given us, the Holy Word of God, mindset on the flesh is death. Friends, can I tell you, it will not work out. 
If you believe in the authority of the Bible, he says, you, you focus on the flesh, you go 100% in that direction, it's death. But the inverse is also true. If by the power of God and that Holy Spirit in you, tapping you on the shoulder says, don't go that way, go this way, take the new path. I know it's unfamiliar, and I know you haven't reacted like this before. I know it'll really freak them out. I know it'll take humility because it's not the person that you were before, and now you're going to be someone new. And you obey that tapping of the Holy Spirit to go a new direction. Can I tell you this? According to the authority of the Word of God, life and peace. You don't have to, you could have just, you know, been born today and figured out, do you want death or do you want life? Do you want chaos and turmoil and the hardship or do you want peace? A peace that transcends all understanding, this, the Christian Bible says. I think that that's what we want. And this is what the spirit-filled living is all about. The spirit and the flesh pull in totally different directions. We don't just do a little bit this and a little bit that. We are all in or we are all out. And it can happen like that. And then that, can, that accuser of the brethren, that enemy, that old enemy of Satan himself and his demons and so whatever, they're going to come down and they're going to immediately condemn you. I can't believe. Don't you know you've been made new? Don't you know that you're going the wrong direction? And they will pound you down. But again, we, we call on the word of God. In Romans chapter 8, it says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Friends, when you have given your life to Christ and you've been crucified with him and your life is no longer your own and it's his and then you make a decision to follow the flesh and you went the wrong way and you went 100% the wrong way and it was totally bad, can I tell you there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? There is conviction and the Holy Spirit of God will say, don't do that. He'll say, I'll put his arm around your shoulder. You'll even feel the comfort of God and he'll say, you're going the wrong way. He will not pound you into the dirt. Is your mind set on the things of the flesh? Have you determined to go that direction? Friends, you're choosing a direction of death. What kind of death, Pastor Ben? Are you saying that I'll actually die, that God will come out of heaven and smite me and I'll die? Hope not. Maybe it'll happen. Doubt it. What kind of death? Gross, de devastating, savage? No. No, but it is a death, isn't it? It'll be a death of the relationship. It'll be a death of that future opportunity that God was granting you. It'll be a death where there is hardship and there is fallout. But on the inverse, what about a mind set on the Spirit? What about the Christian believer who's asking a direction for the Lord, who's, who's following Him, who's seeking Him, who, who doesn't just have to quit their job and change everything around, but instead shows up at their job saying, Lord, what would you have me do today? How would you have me act today? What would be the words on my lips today? How should I spend my time in this office today? Can I tell you that it's life and peace? Well, I looked on the news earlier and I was scrolling on my phone and there's not a lot of life and peace. Follow the Spirit of God. Give your life to Him. A mind fixed on the Spirit is a river of life. It brings peace to the mind. It brings direction to your life. Wisdom floods in. The will of God becomes clear. And you become a source of life for all those around you. What a wonderful thing. Amen? Let's just take a few minutes to look at the deeds of the flesh. This life I live. Do you live the life in the flesh? Verse 19 through 21 kind of outlines it for us. The deeds of the flesh are evident. You don't have to guess. Well, Pastor Ben, what does it look like for an unregenerate unbeliever? What does it look like for a person who's fixed their mind on the things of the flesh? Verses 19 through 21. They're evident. It's clear. They're immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and all things like that. When you break these down, and I'm not going to do it for us today, but I'll look at just a couple of them because we kind of get it, don't we? Uh-oh. And some of them aren't us because they're not our pet ones and they're not the bait that hooks us. All right? Any fisherman knows you got to get the right bait to get the fish you're going for. And all of us have bait. The bait always has a hook, doesn't it? Immorality. This is something that is constantly trying to be redefined today. <laughs> constantly. Pornea. Pornography is what we get the word pornography from it. It is sexual immorality according to a biblical precedent. Any deviancy outside of God's plan sexually is pornea. 
sex outside of marriage, cheating on your spouse, anything in the LGBTQIA plus 2S community, alphabet soup. It's, it's, it's sexual deviancy. It's sexual immorality. It's pornography. It's a deed of the flesh. It's the mindset on the flesh. This is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to go. And in the end, it doesn't bring life and peace. It brings strife. It brings this, the rest of it. Anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. Well, I thought this was the right direction, but in the end, I'm having a knockdown, drag out fight. What happened? The math equation. This plus this equal this is how it turned out. Idolatry. We look at some of these words and we think, well, that seems kind of old-fashioned. Idolatry? Can I tell you that the flesh will so quickly set up an idol in your life? <laughs> Something that your time goes into and your money goes into and it catches your eye and it's just like, oh, this is what it's going to be. And it's the flesh says, fix your eyes on that. It's great. It circles around, doesn't it? In the end, it produces death. Things start to fly apart. I thought that this would bring peace. I thought it would bring life. No, no, that's not the equation. He said it on the flesh, sorcery. I just want to take a moment on this because I thought this was interesting. It comes from pharmaceuticals. The the Greek word there is where we get the word pharmaceuticals. It means to administer drug-related sorcery. In the time and place, what they would use as pharmaceuticals, it was just drugs that that would blur the mind and people would basically get high and then they would have these supernatural religious experiences and they would chase that with drugs. And then the religious experience that they thought that they had, they would just have everybody, hey, look at this, and I'm giving my life to this, and this is important, and this is, you got to see life like this, pharmaceuticals. It's a pharmaceutical. They used it to get high. So you read sorcery in the NASB, and you go, oh, that's kind of weird. That might be some third world country, you know, they're cutting up chickens and stuff. Maybe pharmaceuticals happens right here in America. Maybe we use drugs and so forth to have an experience and we chase that for our lives. This is just life in the flesh, friends. It's not to make us feel bad. It's to give us direction, to understand that if we go that way, it won't equal life or peace. It'll just bring death. I think for many of us, we, if we did a, an accounting for our week that we just had and we looked at what it looked like. Many of these things may not be on there, but maybe some of the jealousy sitting at a stoplight and the brand new pickup truck pulls up and you go, wow, I think I deserve one of them. Or outbursts of anger when somebody didn't do something the way that you wanted. And you, Can you, why would you do that? Dissensions, disputes, factions, jealousy and envy. This is the, this is the flesh. This is just how the flesh works. But let's just end with this. It's his life I live. I don't want to live according to the deeds of the flesh. I want to live according to the life and the spirit. The deeds of the flesh is work. The flesh will just carry that out. But there isn't the deeds of the spirit. No, instead, it's the fruit of the spirit. That the spirit of God in us produces something. It's not just like uh, something that gets clicked like the flesh and just walks and marches its way to death. No, instead, this this is everything done in true partnership with Christ. Notice it's fruit, not work. If you are working for God and you are doing everything to just muster your strength, you're doing it wrong. It has to be fruit. This is coming from John 15, verse 4 through 5. Abide in me, Jesus says. Abide in me and I in you. Jesus is talking to his disciples. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you can't do the fruit. You can't produce the fruit unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, what happens? He bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You want the Holy Spirit in your life? You want to have the fruit of God's Holy Spirit abounding in your life? Abide in Christ. And Christ produces the fruit. You say, Pastor Ben, I'm going to work really hard and just be That list that you talked about earlier, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. I want that to be in my home. I want that in my workplace. I want that when I talk with my kids, and I'm going to work really hard for it. I'd say, friends, it's not work. It's fruit. Well, how do I get the fruit? Abide in Christ. The eyes set on the Spirit, the direction of your life fixed on the Spirit produces the things of the Spirit. What does it produce? Love. Really? Joy. 
Oh, Pastor Ben, I like some of that. Me too. Peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You've been scrolling online lately? You looked at the news? Not a lot of that, is there? Let's fix our eyes on Christ. Let's look to the things of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask God, what would you have me to do today, Lord? How would you have us to respond in our marriages and in our, with our kids and with our coworkers? What, what exactly am I supposed to do? Lean into the Spirit. It's not your life. It's His. It's not your works. It's his fruit. As the worship team comes forward, we start to wrap up today. I want you to really weigh this and, 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 and ask yourself, do I believe that this is true? Do I believe that the, that the flesh offers jealousy and the spirit offers joy? Do I believe that the flesh offers strife and the spirit offers peace? That the spirit offers patience, kindness, and goodness, that that can come from God, that I can have that in my life, that that's a direction for me. The flesh offers the disputes, the dissensions, the factions, that this is all just how the flesh works. Do you believe that? Friends, the Spirit of God is in us. I'll have all of you stand this morning as we wrap up. Jesus looked at those disciples at that time in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you're the light, didn't he? He says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Can I tell you that it's true? The peace of Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. The joy and the love that we want to see in this world is in us if we're in him. It's his life that we'll live. Friends, we do this together, don't we? We're going to carry this into our community. This is how we're going to live our life. We're not going to live 180 degrees away from God and do the things that bring God no glory. We're going to bring him glory. Let's pray as we, as we conclude. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, we know that some of us have just lived a life that just is, if we confess it, God, it's, it's 180 degrees away from what you want. We don't sin a little. We sin 100%. And we don't follow you a little. We follow you 100%. Help us, God, to be found in you. Help us, Lord, flood us with that joy and that peace. Flood us with the patience and the goodness and kindness when we find people following the flesh and the folly and the hurt, that we would be the light. Lord, if there's anyone here today that hasn't given their life to you, I pray they would do it. That they would say, I'm living my own way and I've set my mind on the things of the flesh and it's time to set my, th- my life on the things of the spirit. That you would trust Jesus. That we would listen to him. That we would follow him all of our days. God, for the rest of us, Would you help us be found faithful, Lord? That we would be an example. That people would see the fruit of the Spirit in us and they'd say, man, do I ever want that? And we'd say, we can introduce you to him. (laughs) And we would do that. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you that we get to sing one more song together before we go. In Jesus' name, amen.